but anyway, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings chapter 17. So I've been reading this several books, but, but a couple of books specifically. Uh, I shared on Facebook, I think, last week. One we're going to begin with is Learning to Live Out of the Overflow. Living Out of the Overflow. Just a fantastic book uh, that um, Henry Blackaby wrote to anyone who has been struggling spiritually. I'm going to be honest. It's not just for the pastor. It's for, for anyone who just needs to be picked up by God. And, and so an opportunity, if you have an opportunity to get a hold of that book, read it. If you want to read it, I have it available. You're welcome to mine. Um, but uh, the book was outstanding and it's, and it's Living Out of the Overflow. That's the title. And, and one of the things that I learned is about occasionally in life we are confronted with assignments by God. Right? As a child of God, you need to understand your position is God has called you to action. God has called you to be a part of His kingdom work. It doesn't matter where you are on the totem pole, as you would call it, uh, as a church, as a child of God. If you have confessed Jesus to be Lord of your life, understand that God has an assignment for you. And your assignment is not guaranteed to be 2 plus 2. It's just not. I, I wish it were that simple. You know, that's what we desire, though, isn't it? When we get an assignment, whatever it is, if we're in school... The, see, the idea of an assignment is, is that you learn by working through the problems that you're given. It's to help you elevate your wisdom, right? It's to help you move from where you are to where you need to be. And as a child of God, especially you're going to experience some difficult seasons in life. And the experiencing of those difficult seasons in life, the assignments maybe, are for the building of your godly character. How many of you understand that as a child of God? It's not about you. It's about bringing glory somehow, some way to the King of kings and Lord of lords. If you get that this morning, say amen. Thank you. And so what I've learned is sometimes during these difficult seasons in life is you have to live out of the overflow of knowing Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You have to live out of those moments where you've spent the Word of God and God has shared with you, this is the day the Lord has made and you will rejoice and be glad in it. You, you have to be confident in God's faithfulness to you. I'm learning these things. I'm relearning these things. I'm remembering these things. Because sometimes we all get spiritually beat down, right? And I'm no different as a pastor. And it was good to be away. It was good to be filled. We were able to go. We only missed one Sunday of worship. Um, not being somewhere, but we were able to go. We were able to sit under some preaching and teaching, and it was good. And last week, we were able to go. Uh, we went to a church in Jackson. I'm just going to tell you it was outstanding. And God saved 40 souls last week at that service. And, I, and it just, I was so pumped. I was so filled. I wanted to be preaching last week. And uh, I thought, man, what a wonderful testimony to the power of God, Right? But it's a reminder of God's grace. It's a reminder of God's goodness. And, and it filled me last week. And I come back this week ready to share Jesus with the masses. And so as we learn to live out of the overflow, sometimes uh, you've got to remember that in the difficult seasons, you draw off of God's faithfulness to you in the past. So I have several things that I want to share with you this morning concerning the Word of God. We're going, to, we're going to start with Elijah this morning. But as we work our way through, we're also going to look at some things that Moses experienced as well um, over the next few weeks as we, we look at this new sermon series entitled Overflow. But I want to encourage you to stand in honor of the reading of God's Word this morning. 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 1 through 3. We're going to keep it short and sweet this morning, right? <laughs> uh, I told Miss... Miss Phyllis Terry this morning, she said, I brought my lunch because you've not preached and, and I, I'm just prepared. Uh, so she may have to share her crackers with you. I told her that I've preached through this message four times already and I've dwindled it from, from an hour and a half to an hour and ten minutes. Okay? So you're good. God's Word. Verse 1. And Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall be no dew nor rain these years except 
at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. That's good, isn't it? I want to go on and read verse 4. We're not going to really hit verse 4, but let me read it. And it will be that you shall drink from the brook, and I will command the ravens to feed you there. Let's pray. Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus this morning, thank you for your call upon our lives as believers. We understand that once we trust Jesus to be Lord of our, our lives, once you are Savior of our souls, once we confess our sin and invite you to live through us, we are then accountable to live our lives out loud for your honor and glory. Father, I know sometimes we get tired because of life's burden. Sometimes we get tired because Satan, it feels like he beats us down. But I pray this morning that as your word goes forth, that those who are, who are spiritually burdened would be lifted up. Father, that their soul would be renewed. And, and Father, that there would be a passion that is reignited in their spirit. And after, Father, that they are ready to go out and shout from the rooftop that Jesus is Lord. Lord, we, we live out of the overflow, and Father, I pray that we're able to say today, my cup runneth over because we acknowledge that you are good. Lord, we love you today, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So let me ask you a question. How many of you feel, be, be honest with yourself, okay? You need to do this for you. But how many of you feel like your life is filled with one difficult assignment after another? Be honest. Be honest. Raise your hand. One difficult assignment. Raise them high. You need to be able to see this. Look around. You're not the only one. Look. No, no, no. Leave them high. Look, raise your hand and leave them. Don't be ashamed. Raise your hand. Now look around. You see, you're not the only one that has experienced this. And I needed you to see this. You need to see that, that we all go through some burdensome times in life. And, and it is so that in those moments of disparity, in those moments where we feel like we're just robbed of God's move, spirit moving in our heart and in our life, you need to know that somebody else is or has also gone through much of the same trial and tribulation that you personally have experienced. You need to understand that. And that's when we're able to come together united as brothers and sisters in Christ to lift one another's spirits up. Amen? I mean, uh, an encouraging word is so good. And when we study the word of God, we're able to see this prophet of God who was the master prophet of the Old Testament. We see through his life the difficulties that he experienced through personal ministry. And it was difficult, yet in the moments that he experienced the greatest trials and tribulation, those are the moments that he found a way to draw nearest to God. And that's what you have to learn to do as a child of God in those moments where you feel deprived, where you feel God has, has turned his back on you. You need to know that it's in those moments of your weakness, your physical weakness, that God is doing a work on your soul. You just need to draw close. Amen? And so when God commissions you for a task, listen to me. There are four things I want you to get. When God commissions you for a task. How many children of God do we have? Yeah, don't be ashamed of that. Certainly. All right, so the rest of you are going to get saved today. I trust. <laughs> All right, so when God commissions you for a task, if you are a child of God, there is a job for you to do. If you understand God has a role for you to play in kingdom work, say amen. amen. So when God commissions you for a task, number one, your pedigree is inconsequential. It does not matter who you are, what your background is, where you came from. None of those things matter when it comes to God commissioning you for a task that he has prepared. Your background is irrelevant. And so we see right here from the scripture, the greatest prophet of the Bible, he appears before the wicked and most wicked king of the Bible. And we know very little about him. As a matter of fact, this is what the scripture says. All of a sudden, in 1 Kings chapter 17, you hear this prophet's name, Elijah. It's the first time he's ever mentioned in the Bible. And all of a sudden, when he comes on the scene, this, this guy, this man created in the image of God, we know so little about. And then the scripture says this, and Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead 
said to Ahab. And so there's a couple of different characters right here. We hear Elijah, we hear his name, and then there's Ahab. So who is Elijah? Well, according to the scripture, Elijah was a Tishbite. He was an inhabitant of the land of Gilead. And here is, as a child of God, he is called to an assignment on the very first words that we read of him, you can understand that this was one of the most difficult assignments that any preacher could ever have. And his background did not matter. More than anything, what matters is your ability to be faithful to the task God has called you to. Whatever it is, you need to understand. And so we're revealing these things through, through the Scripture. God is revealing them to us. But nothing about Elijah's past is mentioned. Now, I'm sure that he had already been given some assignments from God. I'm sure that he already had work to do. I'm sure that he had already preached to the multitudes. I'm sure that through Elijah's ministry that thousands of people were saved. But we're not told any of that. All we're told is that Elijah, the Tishbite, comes on the scene. And here he is. He comes on the scene and we're not really worried about his background are we or are we because a lot of times we focus on the experience that someone else has had or, or we want to know what their pedigree is we want to know where he was educated we want to know how long he's been preaching we, those are some of the things that we want to know we want to tell me a little bit about you what's your background like but see God's not so worried about what your background is he just wants you to show up and when you show up for God, He expects you to show out if He's, been, if he's given you a message. Can, is there a chance we can turn these down? Because I, to you they may not be, but to me they're echoing um, badly. And so, so here it is. Uh, Elijah is, we're trying to figure out what his credentials are. And I want to go in and lay this out here before you. This is the one thing you need to understand as a child of God is what your credentials are really don't matter. But what is important is this right here. Listen to Elijah the Tishbite. And he said to Ahab, the most wicked king of the Old Testament, this is what he said, as the Lord God of Israel lives. That tells you a lot right there, doesn't it, Robert? As the Lord God of Israel lives. Tells you a lot because what it tells you now is that here is a man of God who has been in the presence of God. And more than anything else, what we need to know when someone is coming with the message, the pedigree doesn't matter. What matters is, have you been in the presence of God? Have you studied His Word? Have you spoken to Him in prayer? Have you been on your knees? Have you humbled yourself in His presence? Have you stood in the presence of God, spending time with Him, listening to His heart, and understanding that He has a Word for you? Are you... Right now, I'm telling you that God has a message for you to share to somebody else. But the question is, are you spending time in the presence of God? And so we see right here with the scripture, we see as the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand. Elijah was a man that was standing in the presence of God. He's not ashamed that he was standing in the presence of God. He had the audience of one that's so important for us. Do you know that ever since the middle wall of separation has been torn into you have an opportunity to stand before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Stand on your knees. You have an opportunity to, to enter into the presence of God through prayer. Hebrews 4 verse 16, it says it well. It says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. We have an opportunity. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Why do we approach the throne of grace? Why? So that we may find help in time of need. So that we may find help when our spirits are broken. So that we may find help when our hearts are burdened. So that we may find help when we need to be picked up out of the murky, miry clay. That's the reason we go into the presence of God. So that we can hear the voice of God. Amen? So we've got to spend time in His presence. His audience. An audience of one. Never underestimate the enormous influence you can have when you wield the knowledge of God, the Word of God. But you've got to enter into the presence of God for that to happen. It's not possible for you to come to any individual 
with a word from God if you have not been spending time in the presence of God. When God commissions you for a task, your pedigree does not matter. Your pedigree is inconsequential. The second thing that I want to share with you this morning is this. When God commissions you for a task, your audience is not required to play friendly. That's it. Listen, I, I want to tell you something. And, and it, it's that it is difficult to be a pastor in, in, on any level. I'm just being honest. It's not an easy thing to do. And the reason is because we fail to be spiritually lifted the way we need to. We spend time studying always and preparing messages, but we don't always spend time in the presence of God the way we need to. I'm just being honest, right? So, so listen to what I'm sharing with you. It's important for us to do these things. And, and when we come and we share the gospel with the lost individual, which God has allowed me to do on many personal levels, and I'm so thankful to have that opportunity, and then to stand before you on a Sunday morning and, and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ is so good, but listen to me, your audience is not required to play friendly. When God gives you a word and you know you're to share that word, first of all, you must have already stood in his presence. Amen? You cannot have a word of God if you are not, are not in the presence of God. And after that, you have to see that when God gives you a task, it's not always going to be an easy task. But you've got to be faithful. Your audience may not all... The, the thing about a message is it's something that someone else is typically not expecting to hear. So when you share that message, if it's from the Word of God, and, and know this, that it will never contradict the Word of God. If God lays something on your heart, it will not contradict God's Word. It's not going to happen. And so, the audience doesn't have to play friendly. So here it is. We've got this other name, Ahab. We talked about this guy a little bit ago. But who is Ahab? We, we mentioned that he was the most wicked king. He was the son of Omri, which the scripture says in uh, 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 25, I think, that he was more wicked than his father was of Omri, who is Ahab's father. But then we get to Ahab, and according to the scripture in 1 Kings uh, 16, verse 33, and Ahab made a wooden image. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. Do you get that? This guy was a hoss when it come to being bad. He was really good at it. As a matter of fact, one of the things that, that was so bad about him is who he chose for his wife was Jezebel. How many of you know, you know the story, right? And so Jezebel has this father, and his name is Ithbel, and, and Ithbel is a guy who dislikes the God of Israel. And he has chosen Baal to be his God, B-A-A-L, Baal. Now, the, the, the thing about this is this Baal God, as you follow this story on out, and you, you understand a little bit more about it, Baal is the God of the thunderstorm, so to speak. And, and so he is the master of the rainfall. The rain comes at Baal's request. The, the crops grow at Baal's request. All of this. And so they were worshiping this Baal God. But it says right here in the scripture that Ahab was also building these Asherah poles. So he was a Baal God, but he was also a, wor a, a worshiper of, of Asher, which is... A false, dead, dummy God that cannot speak, that cannot hear, that cannot move. Just as Baal is. This false, dead, dummy God that cannot hear, that cannot speak, that cannot move. Now, as we walk our way through the picture of Elijah's ministry and how impactful it really was, you're going to see that he wasn't always fun for Elijah. But it was about his obedience and being faithful to God. So if God calls you to go tell, what are you required to do? Go tell. If, if God calls you, we, we worry about being successful, whether it be in ministry or in life, and the most important thing you need to understand that, the key to success is obedience to God and faithfulness to Him, right? That's where success comes in. And we've got this guy who we know little about, Elijah, at this point. He comes on the scene with a word from the God of Israel, the one true God, amen? And he shares it with the most wickedest king in all 
of the land. The most wickedest king in all of the land. So he was faithful even in the difficult task. So my question to you is, has God given you a message? Has God given you a word? Has God laid something on your heart? As you read and you study the Word, as you pray and you spend time in the present, as you listen for that still small voice, you know, a lot of times we want to see the miraculous. We want to see God work through the winds. We want to see God speak through the fire. We want to see God speak through the hurricanes or the earthquakes. We, that's what we're expecting God. And according to the Scripture, even Elijah, it was with that still small voice that he heard. Listen intently. Entering into the presence of God. I had to be alone a lot over the course of this month. And I'm going to tell you something. There was, there was some spiritual battles. I, you just don't know. There were some spiritual battles that were going on. And, and I'm having to try to listen to God all the while. I hear all of this noise from the outside world. And you have to refocus your attention. You have to refocus your attitude. You have to get into the presence of God. And the only way to do that is to get alone with God. You get alone with God, then if you'll listen, if you'll hush just long enough, one of the greatest problems that we have when we enter into our prayer closet is we're, all, we're doing all the talking. Sometimes we just need to listen. You hear the rain falling lightly? Or is that static from the speakers? Listen. Is it uncomfortable? Sometimes it is, isn't it? You get alone with God. Lord, I, I want this. Lord, I need that. Lord, we're always doing the talking. Hush. And listen. Listen. Open the ears of your heart. God's got a word for you. God's got a message for you, but you've got to listen. Isaiah 52, verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountain are the feet of those who bring good news. I love this verse. Who proclaims peace. Who brings glad tidings of good things. Who proclaims salvation. Who says to Zion, your God reigns. That means rules, by the way. Your God rules. How beautiful are the feet of those on the mountain that bring good news. How beautiful. Is, there, there's irony there. And the reason there's irony is because feet are not pretty. But God calls you and I as His children to spend time in His presence. Don't worry about your pedigree. Don't worry about your audience. Be faithful in the task God has commissioned you for. That's it. The third thing. We might be an hour and a half this morning. <laughs> Amen. The third thing is this. When God commissions you for a task, your message doesn't have to be eloquent. You know, we, we do want the best of everything, don't we? When a guy stands up and he preaches, he needs to be passionate. I agree to that. He needs to be passionate. You know, if someone has been in the presence of God, typically, by the way, they preach it. I, I, that's what I think now, but that's not always, I've, I've learned when I study, that's not always how God works. I have learned more through Charles Stanley, who is very passionate about God, and he doesn't preach anything like I preach. But his ministry is outstanding. But God has created me differently than that. I mean, I holler and scream and spit and I mean, I, that's just how God has created me. It doesn't mean that anyone else's tactics are, are to be forgotten or done away with. It doesn't mean that God can't use someone else. You understand that. Amen or oh me? And so I'm, I'm reading and I'm beginning to understand that your message doesn't have to be eloquent. It, it isn't something that has to be long and drawn out. Some of you can say, amen, preacher. Right? It doesn't have to be long. That, Keith, I don't have to preach an hour and a half. To get the word, he said, nope, <laughs> to get the word across. I don't have to. Sometimes I'm just not finished when I think, uh, so I have to keep preaching until God, I think God's finished, right? And you, most of you are thinking, preacher, when you finish your introduction, God was finished. 
It's okay to laugh. It's good. Go on. Oh, my goodness. You guys are bad this morning. So, so listen. Here's, here's a reality, though. You don't get to choose the message. If God has a message for you, it doesn't have to be eloquent, but you don't get to choose the message at all. That's where it comes that you have had to spend time in the presence of God. You know, a lot of times people want to come to you or they want to come to me, and, and this is what God has laid on my heart. If, it's, if it contradicts the Word of God, then discard it. That's number one, right? But it doesn't have to be eloquent, filled with these $15 words. I don't know any of those $15 word guys. I'm pretty well educated, and I don't know them. I mean, it's just, just the reality. I'm just going to pe preach passionately about the things that God has, has laid on my heart. But here was the message. Because there's, there's some time throughout history that some of the greatest, most powerful messages have been short messages. Abraham Lincoln Gettysburg Address was about two minutes long. How many of you knew that? About two minutes long. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s message was about 15 minutes long. It was just kind of short and to the point, but packed with power. The Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' words to his disciples and to all of those as he stood on the hill on the mountainside. And he proclaimed, this is how you are to live your life. Matthew 5, verse uh, uh, all the way through chapter 7. Look it up and read it. You'll, you'll be amazed at some of the things he said. But that was about a 15-minute message that Jesus preached. Listen. We expect the preacher to preach hard and we expect him to, to preach loud and we expect him to preach long. Well, no, we don't expect him to preach long. But, but this was Elijah's word from God that he took to Ahab. There will be no dew or rain during these years except by my command. That's it. No dew or rain. Now, why was that significant? That's the next question. You remember I already shared with you about this Baal God? I already shared with you about what was going on with, with Ahab and Jezebel and Ethbaal. I already shared with you those things. He, this guy is the God of the thunderstorm. So when, when Elijah, this prophet of God, this man of God who has the message of God, that he has spoken into his heart, specifically comes to the king, this, the most wicked king of the Old Testament, when he comes... When Elijah comes and says before the kings, he, say, he looks him in the eyes and he says, there will be no dew or rain except at my command. Do you know that that was a difficult task? You're thinking, well, that wouldn't have been hard, right? I can come up to anybody. I'm telling you, God's not going to let it rain except at my command. Except at my command. But this was the king. So not only was he going against the king, but he was going against the king's God who is Baal. Do you get it? There's going to be no rain. My God is bigger than your God. My God is better than your God. It's ultimately what Ahab was hearing. Not only that, but in order to get a, an audience with the king, you've got to be able to pull some strings. And so, Elijah heard from God. He listened to God. And when God gave him the command, he went and he did exactly what God called him to do. My question is, God has laid things on your heart. God has called you to a specific task. God has given you a word, but have you been obedient to go and do exactly what God has called you to do? That's a question that only you can answer. And so we already know who Elijah is, and we've seen, he said to Ahab, as the Lord God of Israel lives, so we know that Elijah had spent time in the presence of God, before whom I stand, there shall be no dew nor rain these years except at my word. And now the last thing that I want to share with you is this. Verses 2 and 3 through, through 4. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, Now, Elijah had gone to the king. He shared exactly, excuse me, exactly what God had told him to go tell the king. You remember much like Moses, when Moses had to go, go back to Pharaoh. And we'll get there a little later. But, but he went to the king. He told him what he had to tell him. And you know there was other people there were guards that were around somehow Ahab was able to slip out of that somehow he didn't have a noose around his neck when he finished those words so he must have been sent by God amen and now the scripture says in verse 2 then now there's there's a time there is it, it's a very specific moment when God responded to 
Elijah's obedience. You, you hear me? So the fourth thing is this. Your reward, listen to this. Because when God commissions you for a task, number four is your reward will rarely correspond to your expectations. Because we have an idea of what we pray and hope God gives us when we're obedient. Lord, if I go do this, then I expect you to do that for me, right? That's usually our mentality as God's children. And if that is your heart, if that is your mentality, then pray forgiveness. This very moment, seek God's face and confess that sin to God. Because a couple of things, first of all, you don't get to choose the message. But secondly, the reward is up to God as well. He's going to reward your obedience. Understand that. But how is he going to reward? Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, Get away from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by this brook Cherith. Go hide. <laughs> They're coming after you. You better go hide. They're going to kill you. You better run. You better get away. You can't stay in the king's palace. You better get somewhere else. But if you really listen to what's being said, you understand there's much more to the reward. Because he tells him to go hide by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. And it will be that you shall drink from the brook. And I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. Did you hear this reward? See, there, a drought's coming. And in the midst of the drought, there's not going to be any food. There's not going to be water. But God was going to provide everything Elijah needed for survival. That's a reward in and of itself. Amen? Don't need anything else. If you're obedient to the task God has called you to, even in the difficult seasons, even in the storms of life, whatever it is, you need to understand God, is. if He sees you to it, if He steers you to it, He's going to see you through it. Amen? I really believe that about God. And I can only believe that about God because I have experienced that with God. The same is with you. And so He was given this difficult task. His life literally weighed in the balance, yet His faithfulness was evident. Do you think you can be faithful with the task God has given you? In the difficult seasons, when you're spiritually beat down and tired and you don't feel like you can put another foot in front of the other, when you just want to sit down and you don't want to get up, right? How many of you know exactly what I'm talking about? You're just spiritually broken. You're burdened. And all you want to do is be left alone. Right? You, you know what I'm saying. And so here it is. Then this word of the Lord came to him. Then was God's timing. That very moment, and Elijah obeyed the spoken word of God as he heard God speak in that still small voice. At times we experience silence from God. Don't we? Richard, it's reality, isn't it? And in those moments of silence, we wonder many times, God, why are you punishing me? God, why have you turned your back on me? God, why can I not hear from you? Lord, show me a sign, right? These are the things that we cry out to God. Lord, where are you in this very moment? Where are you in this season? And we cry out to God and we cry out to God and we're wondering, Lord, when are you going to show up? But it's those moments of silence that I think you need to respond with a spiritual inventory check. What do you mean, preacher? I mean, you need to get alone with God. If you're in a valley, you better go to the mountain. You need to get alone with God so you can hear the voice of God. You get alone with God, and, and we all need that refreshing touch from God. Oh, I'm so thankful that God gave me a little bit of what I needed so that I could come and share with you the things that I learned. I'm so thankful that I was able to get alone and, and 
Whether I'm driving down the road, I'm, I'm crying, I'm praying, I'm studying the Word. And, and I'm going to tell you, I, I have a, a lady that God has gifted me with that spends much time with God in the Word. And, and she doesn't even realize that, that God spoke to her and she would speak to me. And that's exactly the thing that I needed to hear at that time because God was using her to speak to me. Do you get how God works? Even when the message is difficult. Doesn't matter who your audience is. You've got to be faithful to share what God has spoken to you. And you can't share what God has spoken to you if you've not spent time alone with God. Do you have a prayer closet? Church, I'm talking to you individually. Do you have a place where you can go and get alone with God? How many, how many of you need a fresh touch? Raise your hand. Yeah. How many of you need a fresh touch? Come on, I, I saw some hands, but I didn't see the rest of you. So, so if you want God to reach down and massage that heart of yours, then you've got to be willing to spend time in the presence of the King. You understand that that doesn't just happen on Wednesday and Sunday. Amen? You understand that you've got to find that quiet place, that you've got to find some, some time to, to get in His Word. For months, I've been reading through the Psalms. The Psalms full of some good stuff, guys. It's full of some good stuff. Some of them are long, some of them are short. 117 is like three verses. All of you can read that in like 30 seconds. But it's good to be able to read the Word of God. And then, and then you have to, th this is what we do. This is, we read and we say that I have done my reading today. I have spent time. Then the Word of the Lord came to him. Now this is talking about Elijah, right? But this is how we read. And then we interpret it. So we don't cross that principalizing bridge ever. Well, so th we think ex this is exactly the principle God wants me to get as well. And so then the word of the Lord came to him saying, get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook Cherith. And, and so in our minds, we're thinking we're supposed to turn east, east, we're supposed to hide by this brook, by this water, this, I mean, we've got to get away somewhere. And that's, that's the mentality many of us have, but we don't, we fail to see the principle. And so you have to ask yourself, what does God want me to learn from this? What word does, does God have for me in this moment of silence, right? Because we, we have moments of silence, and in those moments of silence, you really have to listen. Are you paying attention to God? Because He speaks in ways, He speaks audibly if you will listen. But there's so much noise going on around us. With all of this noise going on around us, it's hard to capture the voice of God. Because God wants to come down. And Brandy, He wants to whisper in your ear. You got it? He wants to come. And, and Brian, He wants to whisper into your heart. He, he wants to, Lori, He wants to share things that are personal, that is just for you. And if you're not spending time in His presence, if you're not listening to His Word, if you're not praying that God will speak to your heart, then you're going to miss, Miss Jerry, that good stuff that God has for us. I believe this very moment, this very morning, God has a word for somebody at First Baptist Henderson. Are you listening? Are you ready to hear the voice of God? If you are, I believe you'll find a way to get alone with Him. You'll begin a, a Bible study, and through that Bible study, God is going to speak directly into your soul. Got to get away from the noise, though, because we're all just a little bit ADHD. It doesn't take much for us to go squirrel, does it? Get alone with God. And then know that God speaks in that still, small voice. I want to have a word of prayer. I want to have an invitation. Miss Joan, if you and David, Steve, if you would come up. I, I don't know what God has been laying on your heart since I've been gone. I, I hope you're thankful that God's brought me back. I, I hope you're not ready for me to leave. 
But God did speak while I was gone. Church, we got some work to do. We've got a lot of things that we've got to get right. We've got to learn to love. We've got to learn to serve. We've got to learn to tell people that Jesus loves them just where they are. And we've got to be willing to make sacrifices and tell lost people that God sent His Son to die on the cross for their sins. That's why we're here. There's somebody you know, someone that you come in contact with, somebody that God has placed in your life that is lost because they've never trusted Jesus to be Lord of their life. Friend, maybe you're here this morning and you've heard this loud message that I've preached. But I want to get real with you now. If you've never confessed that you are a sinner and invited Jesus to be Lord of your life, I want to tell you something. You're lost. I, I'm going to say it just as plainly as I know how. If you were to die today without Jesus as Lord of your life, you would die and go straight to hell. It's just reality. It's not something that I've made up. It's not something that I've fabricated. It is something that I have read and studied from the Word of God. But here's what I can promise you. Because also as I have studied the Word of God, He tells us that if you would confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God the Father has raised Jesus from the dead, then you will be saved. Because with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation, and with the heart, you believe. Amen. So maybe you're here this morning. Everybody bow your heads this very second. Close your eyes. Church. Family, I want you to begin to pray right now for that, that one lost soul. You pray for that individual right now that doesn't know Jesus. For the rest of you, I want to ask you, if you're here and you're ready to confess that you need Jesus to be Lord of your life, and you've never made that decision today, everybody's head is bowed and eyes are closed. If you're ready for Jesus, to save you. I want to see your hand raised high this morning so I can see you. you. Don't be ashamed. It's okay. Nobody's looking but me if God is speaking to you this morning. Amen. All right, church, look up. You know that God is in the saving business, right? But you know also that God is ready to move you out of the situation that you're in, don't you? Child of God, I'm now speaking to you. You've got to get up. You can't continue to sit on the sideline. You can't continue to, hear, to think that you're going to hear the voice of God if you're not going and getting alone with God. So this morning, during this invitation, as David leads, you come and you get down here on your face. And you cry out to God and you listen. And if you need to talk with me, you come and you talk with me. But you've got to find some times that you can get alone with God. And you need to do that spiritual inventory check. Let's start it this morning. You stay. Let's come this morning. David, you leave. Have an old way, Lord.